Hey everybody, Gary Edelman, American Battlefield Trust. Uh, we're really pleased that you are joining us here for our coverage of the Maryland Campaign and Antietam 158. We hope that you will now, right now, share this with your friends so as many people can see it as possible and make it worthwhile for us to go out into the field and do these things as we go along. You may have already seen our video uh, that we recently posted about Special Orders 191. That's also known as the Lost Order. And that sort of sets up uh, this Maryland campaign. As our guest is about to discuss, the Maryland campaign consists of numerous actions, the most well-known of which are South Mountain, Harpers Ferry, Antietam or Sharpsburg, and Shepherdstown. And we're gonna be talking about a lot of these today and in the coming days, and Dennis is gonna set it up. But before we do, I think some of you uh, know uh, that we do some weird things on these. It makes us different than some of the other people doing videos, and I'm often obsessed with middle name trivia, but I've got a new thing. And with our partners at Ancestry or Ancestry.com, we have some prizes to give away this year. We're not gonna be giving away anything today, but keep watching, and I'll give you a tease as to the type of thing I'm doing this year. I'm gonna name two words that are sequential in a well-known quote. And you have to tell me who said it and what the context of it was. For instance, if I were to say ingloriously fly, I might be talking about Joseph Hooker talking about what Robert E. Lee is going to have to do before the Battle of Chancellorsville. If I were to say, and you probably know this one already, if practicable, you might have to say, oh man, that was Lee talking to Richard Ewell at Gettysburg about taking the hill south of town. I've got a whole list of them here. Don't bother looking, you can't read my writing. Um, but with no further ado, um, uh, well, before I bring on my guests, let me just say that at some point, some of these quizzes might result in some free subscriptions to Ancestry. These are $300 value, so we'll talk about that more later. But without further ado, again, let's bring on Dennis Fry. Dennis is um, a founding member of the Association for the Preservation of Civil War Sites, which as you know, became or merged into the Civil War Preservation Trust, which became the Civil War Trust, which is now the American Battlefield Trust. He is early from our business, longtime park ranger and sort of an institution at Harpers Ferry and uh, past president of the American Battlefields Trust as well, and long involved with, and I think current president of the excellent partner, Save Historic Antietam Foundation. I'm gonna come grab the camera from Dennis and then you'll see him. Take it away, sir. Hi, Gary. Hi, everybody. It's really great to be with you here at my home, Harpers Ferry. And I literally did grow up here in this area. In fact, the mountain that you can see in the background that I'm pointing to, that's home. That's the Elk Ridge, the Blue Ridge in Maryland. And uh, I grew up about four miles north of Harpers Ferry. So I had such a blessed career. I, I was able to literally work my entire career as a National Park Service Ranger uh, here at Harpers Ferry National Historical Park in my own backyard, my own backyard. Most National Park Rangers have to move time and time and time again before they would ever come home, and I got to start at home. Uh, so I've really been blessed with a uh, career in history and in battlefield preservation, and I'm really glad to be sharing with you today on something that is so, so important to me and I'm so passionate about, and that's the Maryland campaign. You know, if you were going to summarize this campaign in one word, one word, I want you to think about that for a moment, one word. People that know me know that I like to do things simply. So we're gonna go as simple as you can be. One, one word. What would it be? Just, just pause for a moment. Think about what is that word that summarizes all of this. Everything Gary's gonna film over the next few days. One word. Your word may be my word, maybe. Invasion, invasion. We have a portion of the United States invading the other portion of the United States. Yes, it's a new country, still a fledgling country. The Confederate States of America is invading the United States of America. There is the United States. What you see back there to this side of the gap, and that's the Harpers Ferry water gap you see in the background, two miles from where we are right now. That is the United States. Gary and I are not standing. We, let me say that again. We are not standing in the United States of America. This isn't. We are in the Confederacy. This is a new nation. Oh yes, we speak English, but we are not them. Not now. So right now what's happened is that Lee, downstream from Harpers Ferry, a little more than 30 miles from here, this direction, has crossed the river, come into Maryland, and what you see to the left of your screen, that's Maryland. Maryland has remained in the Union. It is the United States of America. This is an invasion. 
Lee faced one terrible problem that he did not anticipate, that he did not expect. The Yankees didn't cooperate. They didn't follow his plan. Imagine that. The enemy doesn't follow your plan. Lee's plan is pretty simple. We're going to Pennsylvania. We're moving the army to Pennsylvania. Because remember now, 1862 is an election year, an election year. Now, it's not presidential, but it's a congressional election year. And a lot of people forget that this is the first time in American history that a Republican Party has the majority in the U.S. House of Representatives. That's never happened before. 1860, first Republican majority in American history. 1862 is the first time that Republican majority is up for re-election. And if you remember your constitutional history, you'll recall that all appropriations bills begin in the U.S. House of Representatives. And that's the opportunity for Robert E. Lee, the opportunity. Because you see, if he can convince people, the voters of the United States, white males, of course, in 1862, that the Lincoln administration is inept, that the Republicans are incompetent, if Lee can convince the electorate of that, the Democrats win in 1862. And if the Democrats win, you know what they're going to do? They're going to stop funding this war. And you know what happens? Lincoln is powerless. He can't, he can't do anything. If he doesn't have the money appropriated by the Congress, this war's over. And Lee knows that. So this is the grand opportunity. We're going to Pennsylvania because every day we spend in Pennsylvania are votes against Republicans. And Lee is very conscious of this. So politics and invasion, if you only think of two words, that's what's going on in September of 1862. So why are we here at Harper's Ferry? Harper's Ferry was not part of Lee's plan. It was not part of the scheme. Lee wasn't even paying any attention to Harper's Ferry, really. So why are we here? Why are we focused here? Well, it's because the Federals didn't cooperate. So watch my hands for a moment. General Lee intends to go north into Pennsylvania. We're going north, across Potomac River, Maryland, Pennsylvania. He expected the Union Army out here in the Shenandoah Valley, the lower Shenandoah Valley, to abandon the valley and be ordered north. As the Confederate Army goes north, these people out here in the Shenandoah Valley and Harper's Ferries at the northern end of the valley would be ordered out. There's 14,000 federal soldiers here in the vicinity of Harper's Ferry, Martinsburg, Lower Shenandoah Valley. And this is where Lee's plan is foiled. Instead of being ordered to leave, they are ordered to remain steadfast. Don't leave. The Union commander here, Colonel Dixon Miles, M-I-L-E-S, the last orders he receives from Washington before telegraph lines are sliced. You will not abandon Harper's Ferry. You will not. Now, Dixon Miles has been in the Army for 42 years. He knows how to follow orders. And so they don't leave. And this is a problem for Lee because Lee can't go into Pennsylvania with a Yankee Corps, what is in essence a Union Corps, to his rear, behind him. You don't have to be a West Point graduate to understand you don't want the enemy to your rear, ever. And so... Lee at Frederick, nearby Frederick, we can't see Frederick, but as far away as you can see on the horizon are the Catoctin Mountains in Maryland. Frederick's on the other side of that mountain. Frederick's about 20 miles from where Gary and I are standing right now. About a day's march, a good day's march for an army. General Lee has lost patience. Why aren't these people here? Why aren't these people leaving? Finally, he decides we got to get rid of them. And that leads us to Special Orders 191. Now, Gary's already explained Special Orders 191, but here you see the physical manifestation of Special Orders 191, the actual environment, the battlefield environment that Lee is directing his army to. So let me explain. Basically, 191 divides the Confederate Army into four parts. Three, three of those four columns are coming here under the direction of Stonewall Jackson. One column is designed to take this mountain, Maryland Heights, the Elk Ridge. A second column is designed to take this mountain, which is also the Blue Ridge, known as Loudon Heights. And a third column 
is supposed to take the ground that Gary and I are standing on. This is high ground called Bolivar Heights. Now Bolivar Heights is the lowest of the three ridges. Think of Harper's Ferry as inside a triangle, inside a triangle. And those three mountains are the triangle. So place a Confederate battle flag on the top of each one of these mountains and look what happens. The Yankees are caught in the middle. They're caught in the middle. So also think of 191 like this. As the triangle, that's what Lee's objective is, that Jackson is supposed to execute. Take the tie ground, take the triangle, wrap them up inside. But look at this. This is the complexity. Look at this. You have to converge. This triangle has to come together. It has to come together. We've got three Confederate columns moving in three different directions on the compass, and they all have to come together at the same time. And let me ask you, Dennis, uh, did they have walkie-talkies or cell phones? <laughs> I like Gary's questions. <laughs> I hope you're laughing like I am. But, but look at the complexity. Think of this bringing three different columns together without modern communications. They can't see each other. They can't communicate with each other other than with a courier uh, on a horse. And if somebody doesn't show up on time and there's a gap, the Yankees get out. The Federals are able to leave. This is special orders. Remember now, it's special orders, plural, 191. In my opinion, as a professional Civil War historian, is the most complex order Lee issues during the war. Trying to bring three divergent columns together simultaneously without modern communication so they can seal a trap. Very difficult. And Stonewall Jackson's the man that he chooses to make it happen. So let's go talk about Jackson first and let's go talk about what's going to happen here next. So Gary and I are still on Bolivar Heights. We've moved about 200 yards to the west towards the Shenandoah River. Behind me, you now have a much broader view of the Elk Ridge in Maryland Heights. Maryland Heights is the southern extremity of, of the Elk Ridge. The main battle for Harper's Ferry is going to be on top of that mountain because Maryland Heights, of, of the triangle, Maryland Heights is the highest of the three mountains. If, if the Federals hold Maryland Heights, Stonewall Jackson fails. Special Orders 191 fails. They all know that. So the Confederates have to be successful in taking Maryland Heights. So you can see the battlefield behind me. The battlefield is the top of that mountain. So the Confederates are coming from your left to your right. They're moving from the north towards the south. And Miles has forces up there. About a third of his force here is up there. And there's a big fight on September the 13th, the same day as Gary explained to you that Special Orders 191 falls into George McClellan's hands there at Monocacy, uh, outside of Frederick. There's a fight happening on Maryland Heights for the future Harper's Ferry. The Confederates, General Lafayette McClaws' Confederates, Barksdale's boys, and Kershaw's South Carolinians, on top of that mountain, are going to force New Yorkers and Ohioans back from the left to the right. Eventually, the Federals think we're outflanked, we can't hold, most of them are inexperienced soldiers, and they abandon the mountain. They leave the mountain. They come down. They're never ordered to come down by miles. They come down. And that pretty much seals the fate of Harper's Ferry. The Confederates have taken the high ground, Maryland Heights. But Stonewall Jackson's in for a disappointing surprise. Dixon Miles doesn't raise the white flag. There's no surrender. What do we do now? And let me just say that, you know, we're not going up to Maryland Heights right now because we've already shot that. And I'll tell you what, that is a brutal climb if you ever want to make it. Um, uh, go on our YouTube channel and just look for our Harper's Ferry video. I went from the lower town and climbed all the way up Maryland Heights to the Stone Fort. So you can take a virtual tour there. And we're going to pick up next with uh, on Schoolhouse Ridge, a place you may have heard of that involves Stonewall Jackson and the Trust.
So we're now standing at the western base of Bolivar Heights. Schoolhouse Ridge, Jackson's position. Three Confederate divisions. The Stonewall Division, Richard Yule's division, but old Baldy's not here. Remember, he was badly wounded at 2nd Manassas, so it's under the command of a lawyer from Georgia, Alexander R. Lawton, and then A.P. Hill's division. So there's about 15,000 Confederates here. Remember, we have sealed the trap. The main federal position is right up here. Look at this, look at this, Bolivar Heights, Bolivar Heights. Look at that elevation. This is what Jackson has to attack. Now, now think about this for a moment. You're very familiar with Stonewall Jackson and, the, and his battlefields. Most of you walked the ground that Jackson fought. You probably haven't walked this. I want, I want you to know something. This elevation is higher than Little Round Top. Stonewall Jackson has to attack a mountain with the Federal Army on top of it that's taller elevation-wise, steeper than Little Round Top. Now, Jackson did crazy things, and many people even say Jackson was crazy, but he didn't believe in suicide. I mean, this is a suicide assault. From Schoolhouse Ridge to this position, nearly one mile of open expanse, one mile of open expanse, and there's a big difference from what you see today. Almost no trees, there's no cover. So the Confederates are coming at you from Schoolhouse Ridge, if Jackson orders a frontal assault, across this ground and then up that slope. And there's one other thing that's different, no trees. The Yankees can see you the entire mile, one mile. That is a picket Pettigrew charge at Gettysburg that you are under fire, artillery fire from Bolivar Heights. Dixon Miles has a formidable position, Stonewall Jackson knows it. So what's Jackson gonna do? They won't give up, they're not giving up. He brings the artillery to the tops of the mountains at Maryland Heights and Loudoun Heights and begins to blast them. Miles still doesn't give up on September the 14th. So that's when Jackson comes up with a plan. And the plan is this. We're going to do two things. One, we're going to assault this position. Oh yeah, you heard me. We're going to assault this position. That's insane, you say. No, not if we do it at night. Well, that's even more insanity because if you know Civil War history, nobody attacks at night. Jackson is going to stage a night assault against this position. Meanwhile, simultaneous to this attack, we're going to do a flanking maneuver. We're going to take A.P. Hill's division from the southern end of Schoolhouse Ridge, off to your right, down to the Shenandoah River, and ask Hill to maneuver along the river and come up behind the Yankees, come up behind them to the Chambers Farm. Jackson can't see it from here, but he knows it's there. Because remember, this was Jackson's first command of the Civil War. The first time he commanded troops in the field during the Civil War, he was assigned to Harper's Ferry in 1861. So he knows that Chambers Farm is over there, about two miles from here. And he knows that if he can put Confederate infantry and artillery on the Chambers Farm, on the lowest portion of Bolivar Heights, behind the Yankees, which are up here, he can succeed. So two maneuvers at once, an assault head on at night and a nighttime flanking maneuver. Well, here they come, rebel yell, musket fire you would see, artillery explosions. Dixon Miles thinks he's under attack. He thinks he's under assault. He doesn't know this is a fake attack. It's a faint assault. Jackson's making commotion and noise to try to convince Miles, here they come. In the meantime, where's the real maneuver? A.P. Hill creeping around the exposed Union flank. And it works, it works. Miles doesn't know about Hill's maneuver. The Confederates come to about where we're standing right now. They never try to go up the mountain because that wasn't intended. Jackson's ruse works and Hill will take position that night and Dixon Miles doesn't know it. Okay, and I'm going to ask you, Dennis, to talk about some of the preservation here. But before we do, I want to make sure you all understand we were over in that direction on top of Bolivar Heights looking toward Maryland Heights and Loudoun Heights. And then we moved a little along the heights, okay? And now we're here. And for the next video, we are going to go and overview the Chambers Farm back from the top of Bolivar Heights. But Dennis, tell us a little bit about how this land came to be preserved. 
Well, this is not only a battlefield from September uh, 13, 14, 15, 1862, but it is really important in battlefield preservation history because the ground that Gary and I are standing on right now is hallowed ground not only because they fought here, but because it represents a first. This land here is the very first acquisition by the original Civil War Trust. We're standing on that ground. First purchase made by the Civil War Trust. Good thing they did. There's 56 acres here on this section of Bolivar Heights, this open ground. It was an orchard, a huge orchard here in Jefferson County, West Virginia. Sold to a developer. The developer intended to take this 56 acres and turn it into condominiums and apartment buildings. And he had the support at that time of the local government. This would have been destroyed. It wasn't. Fortunately, we had the great, great economic collapse of 1988-1989. That's a preservationist great friend. <laughs> and he went bankrupt. And when he went bankrupt, the bank reclaimed this property. And the Civil War Trust did a heck of a deal. I was fortunate enough to bring the sides together because I was chief historian here at the time and knew this was available. Knew the bank, knew the bankers. And uh, of course, knew the trust and the trust leadership married everybody together and all of us together were successful in saving this land. So Gary and I, we feel it. And you need to come here to Harper's Ferry and feel it because this is a first. This is the first time if you remember the Civil War Trust, you saved a battlefield. And if I may, too, it didn't end there. I said that we'd saved um, something like 500 acres here at Harper's Ferry. It wasn't long till 166 more acres across the road um, along Schoolhouse Ridge were also acquired. So now people can come here and they can uh, walk from one to the other and they can walk up Bolivar Heights and get a good feeling for it. This is what you do. The members double, of the double trust. thumbs up, all hands up, all fingers up. Hallelujah to the members of the American Battlefield Trust. Thank you as a original founder. Thank you. And we'll see you up at the Chambers Farm in just a sec. So, Sunday night, September the 14th, the Confederates are moving. They're moving. And the key maneuver is that flanking maneuver by A.P. Hill's division from Schoolhouse Ridge south to the Shenandoah River with the objective being the Chambers Farm, today known as the Murphy Farm. You can see it in the distance. You can see it behind me. You'll see a white house just to your left and an open field. That is the historic Chambers Farm. And so what we wanna do is place AP Hill on that ground because that's Bolivar Heights. Gary and I are still here on the federal position. Now the Federals are facing this direction this direction, because that's where most of the Confederates are. That's where Jackson is, off to the west. So if A.P. Hill comes in behind to the rear, to the rear, we have the enemy behind us. And not only removing four, five thousand Confederates that night, but we're bringing 20 pieces of artillery with us. 20 pieces of artillery that we're going to lift from the Shenandoah Valley to that farm. Monday morning, Miles knows nothing about this maneuver, nothing about this flanking maneuver. Monday morning, fall. Fog so thick you could put your hand out in front of you and almost not see your own hand. But as people that live around here know in September, that fog doesn't last long. Boy, the sun comes, it begins to burn, and it starts to rise. One soldier referred to it as a, a, a theater and a stage and the curtain rising on that stage that morning. And as that curtain rose, oh my, Dixon Miles, Colonel Miles, where did they come from? Where did they come from? They're at 800 yards, point blank range, Confederate infantry to his rear in position. 20 pieces of artillery open up on his backside. And the barrage is, is unbelievable. Plus Confederate artillery blasting from Loudon Heights, the crest of Loudon Heights, and from Maryland Heights. Uh, and then from Schoolhouse Ridge, we've got artillery coming in from four different directions. And, and they can't hold. They can't, they can't. They can't put themselves in position. There's no way they can line up. It's murder. It'd be suicide. So Miles recognizes this. He calls the Council of War of his officers. He says, what should we do? He knows what he wants to do. Everybody agrees. Unanimous. White flags up. White flags up. And so the Federals will surrender. They'll surrender. Morning of September 15, 1862. Jackson 
has accomplished almost an impossible feat here. Remember how complex Special Orders 191 is? And you know the main story of Special Orders 191 is not the convergence and not even Harper's Ferry. What people remember and you remember about Special Orders 191, it got lost and was found. No, 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 no. The big story is it succeeded. It succeeded even though it was lost and found. Jackson succeeded at Harper's Ferry. He captures the place, the Union force here, surrenders and this frees Lee. He has no rebels, he has, he has no Yankees behind him anymore. The problem is George McClellan is now in front of him. South Mountain and moving towards Sharpsburg and Antietam Creek. So the situation's changed dramatically. Despite this great victory, 191 is now irrelevant, immaterial. Lee is along the Antietam Creek. Two thirds of the Confederate Army, two out of every three rebels is down here Lee sends a message to Jackson, get your tail up here as quickly as possible. We got to bring our army back together again. And Lee is along the Antietam Creek waiting, waiting for Jackson to move his forces from victory here at Harper's Ferry to join Lee for hopeful victory somewhere in Maryland, perhaps along the Antietam Creek. The fruits of victory here for Jackson, no other Confederate victory of the war like it. Jackson will capture here nearly 13,000 United States soldiers. The largest surrender of United States forces during the American Civil War. It is a disaster for the Yankees. An entire Union Corps basically wiped out by Stonewall Jackson in what really is his greatest tactical victory of the war. Great, I'm gonna give the camera to Dennis here. Hopefully it won't fall off. And um, so this is great. Thank you, Dennis. And um, what I would say is, of course, I think this is going to dovetail in with, with what we're going to say a little bit later. And that is that Jackson does move with all possible haste, but he has to leave someone behind. I think you know who that is. Let me say, let me not say who that is. It's a fast moving division commanded by a guy who's often sick, but who can move quickly when he needs to and kind of likes to go into battle. So I'll let you ponder that one there. Um, I want to say that we have a lot more coming. Um, join us on September 16th and September 17th as we cover as much uh, uh, of the Maryland campaign as we can. We're talking South Mountain. We're talking Antietam, not on just the 17th, but the 16th as well. And we're talking about the Battle of Shepherdstown. We'll do as much as we can. We don't know when we can post videos. It's all subject to connectivity and being out in the field, but expect some special guests. You'll see Dennis, Dennis back again, Tom Clemens, Dr. Carol Reardon, Dr. Jim Brumall, uh, my buddy Tim Smith, um, as well as uh, um, Brian Cheeseboro, Doug Ullman, uh, and a whole fiesta of trust people. Uh, Kevin Pollock as well, licensed battlefield guide at Antietam. I'm sorry for anybody else I'm forgetting. So, um, so just make sure you join as much as you can and share these things with your friends. Look out for our quiz with our partnership with Ancestry.com um, so we can award some stuff and then just know that what this is all about, the whole reason we're out here today and we're going to be spending a lot of the week um, out in the field is of course to preserve more American land and to educate the public about why this matters. Well, you know, what happened in these early founding conflicts, the Rev War, 1812, and the Civil War, and why it matters today. And you, the members and supporters of this organization, have already helped us to preserve some 2,000 acres in the Maryland campaign. That's 700 acres at South Mountain, 550 acres here at Harper's Ferry, including portions of Schoolhouse Ridge that you've already seen. Uh, there we go. Dennis likes this. He's nodding up and down. Um, we're talking about 450 acres. Um, um, at uh, the B at battlefield of Antietam and a like amount, um, a little bit less at Shepherdstown. So thank you, thank you to all you members. We hope you can join us and thanks for watching.